with you once again. And uh, what a beautiful decoration you've got here. Something, someone's done some, a lot of hard work on that. So well done there. Um, our call to worship, it's from Genesis chapter 8. And this is God's promise to Noah after the flood. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. Just before we go on, later on you'll see on there, number 130, we've got probably the best part of all the harvest here. Is we plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. But I've often thought that Really, we're laying ourselves open to a charge under the Trades Description Act there. <laughs> because, I mean, I've never ploughed a field in my life. And I don't know that very many people here would have done it. Um, and, and as for scattering the good seed on the land, well, any farmers worth their salt will tell you how wasteful that is. <laughs> Nowadays, each seed goes in just the right place at just the right spacing, just the right depth to make sure that it grows properly. And with all that in mind, I came across a little poem. Um, it's written by somebody called Arnold Kellett. I found this in a local printer's magazine some years ago. It's called Supermarket Harvest. And it goes like this. What does the harvest mean to me? I neither sow nor reap, but glean through supermarket shelves to see what's going cheap. No mellow fruitfulness is here, but sterile, tidy tins, and crops all smart in cardboard coats and glossy plastic skins. No harmony of autumn leaves, but glaring lies enticed. And labels scream, there's ten pence off, it's cheaper half the price. No sound of tractors in the fields, but crammed full trolleys clash, and jingling tills bind sheaves of notes and gather in the cash. No need to plough and scatter now the good seed on the ground with canned, convenient, frozen food, it's harvest all year round. So, through these claustrophobic fields, robot-like I roam, and long for fragrant country air and joys of harvest home. And chapels heaped with fruit and flowers, arranged with holy art, where grateful mortals yield to God the harvest of the heart. So, through that soulless checkout point, Bring all you can afford and check in here at East Cow's Church and come and praise the Lord. Oh, <laughs> Let's do just that and turn in our hymn books and at the 1 of 1 7 sing praise to God who reigns above the God of all creation.
great and wonderful God, to you alone belongs all glory, honour and power. You created the whole universe and everything within it. You shaped the great mountains and oceans that endure for millions of years. And yet you are also the creator of fragile flowers that bloom and fade and die in just a few days. And delicate insects whose lifespan can be measured in hours. Everything that lives and breathes is a sign of your handiwork. The love you show for each of us is beyond our imagination. In Jesus Christ, your Son, you've shown us what human life should be like and how it should be lived. By his death on that cruel cross at Calvary, he saved us from our sins and our failings. By his defeat of death and his glorious resurrection, he shows us the way to glory and eternal life in your presence. Lord God, we come to worship you and to praise you. We acknowledge that you give meaning to our lives. Indeed, without you, we can never be fully alive. To you, holy and loving God, be glory, honour and power in our worship, in your church and in your world, now and forever. Amen. For our prayer of confession, there is a response here. In answer to the words, in your mercy, would you please respond, forgive us and help us. In your mercy, and the response is, forgive us and help us. So let's pray. God, our Father, we confess that we've often used your gifts carelessly. And we've acted as though we were not grateful. Hear our prayer. And in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we enjoy the fruits of the harvest, but forget that they come from you. In your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we are full and satisfied, but ignore the cry of the hungry and those in need. In your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we are thoughtless and do not treat with respect or care the wonderful world that you have made and entrusted to our keeping, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. When we store up goods for ourselves alone, as if there were no God and no heaven, in your mercy, Forgive us and help us. Grant us thankful hearts and a loving concern for all your people. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And I ask you now to turn to the back cover, inside the back cover of your hymn books, and join me in the modern version of the Lord's Prayer. I'm just inside the back cover of your book. So we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our second hymn is number one, two, two.
Take the gratitude we give. Take the finest of our harvests. Crops we grow that all may live. nor about your body, 
what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This is the Gospel of Jesus. Thanks be to God. Okay, so I have three things. And now, as an act of worship, let my God free will offer unto the Lord. Let us pray. Dear Lord, your mercy never fails us. You shower so many blessings upon us in so many different ways because of that great love that you have for us. Lord, we return to you these gifts of money as tokens of our love for you. We pray you will use these gifts and use us, the givers as well, in your world to further the coming of your kingdom. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Saviour, and our friend. Amen. Thank you for our once again in terms of number one, three, oh, to plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. <laughs>
verse 35 and 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Once again, we gather to witness the cycle of the seasons, the yearly proof of that promise that God made with Noah, with which we began our service. A promise that as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. And each year we come to celebrate and to thank God for all the good things that he's given us. The harvest of the land and of the sea. God and people working together in partnership for our benefit and for our blessing. This is a yearly opportunity to remind ourselves that all these good things do not come just from our own efforts but from our partnership with God. And we need to remember too that God is the main partner. He is in control. And two of my favourite harvest stories show that. And both of them are true. The first happened many, many years ago in a place a long way away from here in a little village in North Germany called Grosslastis. On one evening there, the village council met to discuss an important matter, the church bell. The villagers were very proud of their lovely little church and every Sunday morning the deep sounds of the bell used to have rung out loud and clear across the village calling people to come and worship in the church. But something bad had happened to the bell. Now when it was rung, instead of a sounding a pure, clear note, it just made a horrible thudding noise. And when they looked at the bell, they'd seen that it had a deep crack in it that couldn't be patched up. The bell needed to be replaced by a new bell, or it needed to be melted down and recast. Well, the village council decided that the village did need a new bell, and so they started a collection. And although the village people weren't very rich, people did give generously to, to the collection, and it wasn't very long before a small group of villagers set off to the nearest city with the money to go and buy a new bell. But they came back without a bell and full of disappointment. They found that bells were far, far more expensive than they had ever thought. And the money that they collected was nowhere near enough to buy a new bell. And there seemed no hope that they could ever manage to save that amount of money to buy a new one. They were very disappointed and couldn't see that their little church would ever have a new bell. Many villagers didn't give up hope, but they couldn't think of anything that they could do except to pray about it. Some months later, one autumn, uh, on a Sunday, the village schoolmaster was walking past the church and he noticed something rather unusual. A grain of wheat had somehow got lodged in a crack in the church wall. And evidently there was enough water there and enough soil for it to grow because a healthy shoot was sticking out of the wall and that shoot was bearing six well-formed ears of wheat. And the schoolmaster collected them carefully and he took, took them home and stored them away. The next spring, he planted that grain in a corner of his garden. And then, in, <coughs> later on in the year, harvested it and stored that grain away. And the following 
year he did the same thing, and the year after that. And the following spring he found he had a bit of a problem. His garden wasn't big enough. So he passed some of the seed corn out to some of his friends and neighbours in the village for them to plant, and so it went on. When eventually they ran out of room in the gardens, helpful farmers made land available to them in the fields. And after eight more years, <coughs> they had such a magnificent harvest that when they sold it to a merchant, they had enough money to buy a new bell. And I'm told that if you go to Grosslasfitz today, you'll find that the church there still has that bell which those villagers worked for and bought all those years ago. If you climb up the bell tower, I'm told that you'll find engraved on that bell is the date when it was bought. 15th of October, 1729. And something else has been engraved on that bell, a 6 year stalk of wheat. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think that story gives us a number of points to think about. I found four. Firstly, somebody needed a vision. The God-given opportunity was there in the six years of wheat. But if the schoolmaster had just noticed it and said, now that's interesting, and walked on, the project wouldn't even have got off the ground. <coughs> Excuse me. But although that isn't to say that God wouldn't have had another plan. The second point was that the vision on its own was not enough. Somebody needed to do something. <coughs> Somebody needed to act. In this case, the schoolmaster needed to take the trouble to collect the ears of corn and to care for them, to plant them and to harvest them, and then to involve other people in the project. The third point is that God needed to be in it. The people of Gross Lashfields had to feel sure that this was God's will, that this was God's plan, that they were working with God and for God, and that they were keeping in touch with God through worship and prayer and through reading his word. And the fourth point is that when God is involved, great things happen. From small beginnings, tremendous things took place. First, six years of wheat, then a small plot in the garden, and then a garden full, and then gardens and fields full, and then enough to buy a new bell. Remember our text, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That was tested and it was proved by those people of Gross Lustis. They did seek God's kingdom, having faith and trust that in his good time and by working in partnership with him, the other thing that they desired, the bell, was given to them as well. Now we might think that that story of Gross Lustis and its bell hasn't got a lot to say for up to us. For after all, it happened a very long time ago, and it happened a long way away from here. But can God, does God work like that, nearer to home and in our lifetimes? I firmly believe that the answer to those questions is yes, he can, and yes, he does. Back in 1992, we had a church mission weekend at Newport in the Methodist Church. A team of people came to us to worship with us and pray with us and talk to us over the weekend. And it was run by the Lay Witness Week movement. And it came at just the right time, as far as Gwen and I were concerned. And as a result of that weekend, Gwen and I 
join the lay witness movement. As we were willing to take part, to go on teams, going to other churches over other weekends, we had to do some training. We were booked in for a training session one Saturday at Staines Methodist Church in Middlesex. We travelled up by train, we got off at the station, and we set off to find Staines Methodist Church using the map that we'd been sent. And I suppose both of us were expecting to find a similar building to our church in Newport. So when we turned the last corner, and we looked for the church on the other side of the road, and it wasn't there, we thought we'd gone wrong. Or to be more precise, Gwen thought I'd gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side of the road, we thought to find the church, expected to find the church, there was a modern office block with a distinctive pattern of brickwork around the windows and doorways, and it looked deserted. But there was some activity going on around a smaller version of that building that was just beside it. So we crossed the road and we went to inquire there. And it turned out that this was the church. And, uh, an impressive entrance led off the street into a large foyer. And there, a modern kitchen was serving coffee and tea to hordes of shoppers, whilst in a nearby room a lot of children seemed to be having fun. And we met up with Mike Ashton, who had been one of our lay witness team at Newport, and he showed us around. The place was packed with people, taking a break from their Saturday morning shopping. Farther in was the worship area, quite compact, but with well-designed uh, fold-back screens to accommodate larger gatherings when they were needed. It was well lit, it was easy to heat, it had comfortable chairs and lots of folding tables. And everything seemed nearly new. Here was a busy, active, purpose-built church, well-placed to minister to the needs of a busy town. Mike told us that the Methodist Church congregation in Staines used to meet in a Victorian building tucked away at the side street <clears throat> and it ticked along with about 40 to 50 active members. But despite having some sincere and committed Christians, <clears throat> it wasn't well placed to reach out to the town in general. And one year, they were devastated when a quick friendly inspection found that urgent repairs needed to be made to the roof. And the estimated cost was something over £80,000, which in those days was the sum that was way, way beyond their means. And they just couldn't see how they would ever raise that sum. And as Mike put it, <coughs> we had to do some serious praying. Within just one month, the church was approached by a property developer who had purchased land on either side of the church, and he said if they could see their way to selling the church building and the site to him, he'd build them a purpose-built new church on the town centre site and give them £50,000 to get it up and running. And Mike said he couldn't remember a shorter, extraordinary church council meeting. <laughs> Whether it's in places like Gross Lassets or Staines or anywhere else for that matter. When God takes control, when people put their faith and their trust in God, when people are prepared to give of their best efforts to work for God and work with God, then the harvest of his reap can be truly awe-inspiring in its richness and in its abundance. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, 
I don't believe it's safe this will be given to you as well. Amen. Our next hymn is number <coughs> 727. 727. This is our friend, Pat Green. God in his love for us lends us his planet, gave it a purpose in time and in space, swallows us far from the fire of creation, cradle of life, and the hope of our race. Would it help you if you play the tune through? <coughs>
Raise the song. 